Good afternoon, and this is Kim McCleary. I'm President and CEO of the Seafoods Association of America, and I'm here with my colleague Lee Reynolds today for the second webinar of our Spring 2013 webinar series. And we are delighted that you have made time in your day to be with us this afternoon, and we uh, are looking forward to sharing some important information with you about upcoming opportunities for MECFS advocates to influence public policy and to make an impact on um, policymakers and decision makers over the next several weeks and then even farther into the future. So before we get started with the actual program, I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to uh, introduce the series and remind folks about what the first program in our series was and also to introduce my colleague Lee Reynolds, who is new to the Seafoods Association. She joined us in January and is our engagement manager, and that is a new position for us. But I wanted to introduce her at the outset because we are going to have a little bit of a conversation over the next hour with all of our participants out there in webinar land. So uh, Lee, would you like to say hello? And that way I would love voice? to say hello. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm thrilled that so many of you have joined us today. I hope we're going to um, definitely bring some value to the time we spend together. Great. And Lee um, joined the association, as I said, in January. She has more than 20 years, as young as she looks, she has more than 20 <laughs> years experience working with various uh, patient communities in um, the multiple sclerosis world. She was with the Multiple Sclerosis Society for many years and mm -hmm. did a number of different uh, jobs with them. and more recently with the Polycystic Kidney Disease Foundation and an organization that, that she helped start called Kidney Wise that really branched out across many different um, kidney-related conditions and not just polycystic kidney disease. And then more recently has been uh, was with a company that did events for a lot of different uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, disease communities, blocks. So we are just thrilled to have Lee with us, not only today, but full-time working on behalf of the MECFS community and bringing her many years of experience and her engaging personality to our cause. So welcome, Lee, for the first time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. It's a very nice introduction. And, and I just want to say uh, very quickly that I'm, I'm excited to be working in, uh, with the association and getting to know all of you. And, um, it's been a rewarding first few months to learn more about ME and CFS and get to know some folks in the community. And one of the things when, when people ask me what I do for these two decades, I've worked with all of these various um, single disease, patient-focused type organizations, is my goal is to help people find their voice, find their strongest voice, be their own best advocates, help organizations find their strong voice and, and reach their patient population to the best way they can. And so this is a great topic today. Um, I feel like it's an important topic, and hopefully it will be something that you'll take great benefit from, not only for the context of what we're talking about specifically today, which is the upcoming FDA meeting, the opportunity for some public testimony, but that you'll have some takeaways in how to more effectively commun communicate about this condition that affects your life in so many ways um, to all the different folks in your life and, um, and become a stronger advocate and find your stronger voice for different venues beyond just the impending meeting. So we'll touch on some specifics for the FDA meeting at the same time that will hopefully give you some, just some basic communication tools that will help you in a broader sense as well. So I'm, I'm honored to be here and, and humbled to be a part uh, of the mission. Great. Thanks, Lee. I'm going to jump ahead and, and just talk about our spring webinar series and some context setting um, points. As I said uh, when we first came on the broadcast, this is the second of our six weekly webinar programs that we've planned through May 9th. And uh, hopefully the information you've received from us uh, gives you a full schedule and we'll um, just preview the topic for next week at the end of today's program. Um, and the reason that we've set up this webinar series and specifically chosen the topics in the order in which they are unfolding over the next few weeks is to catalyze our community for informed participation and action 
um, at two upcoming meetings, and these are really sort of, as we said, the, the focal point for today's discussion, but the tools that we hope you'll leave here with um, will be beneficial and hopefully um, impactful for you far beyond the scope of these two events. Um, in addition to our webinar series, we're also collecting patient-focused survey data for the FDA workshop and other policy venues. Uh, sorry for that time on box, which is popped in there. Um, earlier this morning when I checked, we had 953 participants so far, and we had initially set a goal of 500 participants, so now we uh, quickly increased that goal and would love to have 1,000 respondents in time for the FDA workshop, and I hope uh, that we will maybe have that goal met by the weekend. And the um, one interesting uh, little tidbit that's come out of this survey is that 89% of the people who have responded so far indicate that they've been diagnosed with NECFS by a healthcare professional. And that data, that statistic has been consistent from about the first 25 survey respondents that we had all the way up through almost 1,000. So that's been a very stable uh, figure and I think is a really good sign um, of change that has occurred over the last several years when that figure was always lower. There were many more people who self-reported and had to, uh, in essence, self-diagnose and weren't able to get um, an appropriate diagnosis from a healthcare professional. And I think that 89% figure um, somewhat is reflective of the audience we reach. And people are well informed and are in um, at least some sort of care setting. But I do think it's um, a good sign that that number has improved, grown up, grown over the years from being around 60 to 70 percent to now being about 90 percent of people have uh, quote unquote uh, physician uh, based diagnosis. Just a couple of um, sort of housekeeping details for those of you who, uh, for whom this may be your first webinar with the CEDIS Association. We do make every attempt to record our webinars. Um, and post the recordings up on our Solve CFS YouTube channel. And when that works well, we can do that really pretty uh, quickly and, and sometimes even by late in the same day or by tomorrow um, in the weekend at the very latest. If we have a glitch and a problem and we have to um, do something to the recording to make it viewable, it does take a bit longer. But uh, things seem to be going smoothly today and we'll hope that that continues. Um, we have posted several additional resources for your review and reference that relate to today's topic in the series as a whole and the upcoming meetings on our Research First site. And you'll get links to those in a follow-up email that you'll receive uh, that will also include the URL for where the webinar recording uh, can be found. And please know that even though we may not get to every question that you submit either today during the program using the chat uh, feature on your control panel or that you might have submitted through the registration process, all of the questions and all of the comments you submit do help shape the program's um, move going forward and also things that we may have uh, sort of in a planning stage for later in the year. So um, if we're not able to get to all the questions, and sometimes it's easier than others, today may be a little difficult because Lee and I are both going to be talking through the whole thing and I'm going to have the nice benefit of listening to a long presentation by somebody else during which I'm able to um, get some of the questions that come in in writing. So we'll do the best we can and um, again welcome you to submit questions uh, in any way via email or on our Facebook page or through Research First, uh, the comment features there that will be valuable to us whether we can address them all today or not. Um, just by way of recap, because we built this webinar series with a very uh, intentional um, set of messaging, I just wanted to recap the program that we had last Thursday at this time, on uh, March 28th, when we had Kristen Shannon from uh, Faster Cures with us to give an overview of the drug development landscape. And this was really to help set the context for today's conversation and also the program that we'll be presenting next week. And Kristen shared with us um, the, the sort of long, uh, challenging path for a discovery to get from this side of the valley of death, the lab, 
across this very tenuous bridge to the patient waiting often impatiently on the other side and all the casualties um, that can occur when you're moving from left to right uh, in this particular diagram. Um, this recording is available on our Solve CFS YouTube channel and you'll get a link to um, that when, uh, in the next day or so when we get the new recording uploaded as well. Um, this is a, a slide that Kristen showed us last week, and if you think of this as a pipeline, the drug development pipeline, um, and she made the point um, a number of times that it's not quite as linear as any of these pipelines look. But if you think about a discovery going from the lab to the market, um, and that being a treatment-related discovery, it can take this much time, and you go from about five to 10,000 compounds to get to one FDA-approved drug. And I make this point because it will come in in terms of what the FDA is looking for and how um, advocates should think about the messaging that they share with the FDA and other um, federal agencies as we think about the upcoming opportunities to influence policy. Um, Kristen also shared uh, with us his background um, because so often in the patient advocacy world, whether it's MECFS or MS or any number of other conditions, the real sort of um, comparison that a lot of people draw is let's just do what the AIDS activists did. And so Faster Cures um, about two years ago undertook a, a process where they really did sort of a 20-year retrospective on what did the HIV AIDS activists do in those early years. Um, people tend to remember the very theatrical moments of activism where the HIV-positive patients were throwing blood uh, at different federal sites or different individuals and how um, dramatic that was when it showed up on newsreels. But um, when Faster Cures really talked to the people who were involved at that time, both from the advocacy side and from the policy side and also from the scientific side, it really came down to these five elements with a strong emphasis on the knowledge and solutions that the activists brought into the rooms that they were, where policy was being made that they were trying to influence. And Margaret Hamburg has this quote, and at the time Margaret was a public health official. She's now the administrator for the Food and Drug Administration. Um, her point and many other points were that the, the activists were really quite sophisticated in their understanding of science and particularly the regulatory process by which the treatments they sought access to um, could be made available to patients earlier in the process than they otherwise might have been. And that knowledge and that ability to think about creative problem solving was really the key to um, the, the changes that the activists were able to influence. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. So today, what we'll focus on, um, as, as uh, Lee introduced, is finding the strongest voice for public testimony. Um, we have several opportunities coming up, and the federal agencies are actually pretty um, aware and inclusive when they set up these federal meetings to invite and to make way and make room for the advocates' voice in their discussions. And that is a change uh, very much over the last 20 years that we have a, a lot of activists to um, thank for it. not just HIV AIDS, but the breast cancer movement, and to a large degree the NACFS community has always insisted on having a seat at the table. And now um, more and more they are including us very formally in those conversations in ways that um, we really had to fight and spend a lot of political capital to get to in the past. So today the objectives that we have are uh, for Lee and I to help you understand um, a few specific things, one being the FDA's uh, new program that is called the Patient Focused Drug Development Initiative and how it applies to MECFS, the process for providing testimony to the FDA and other upcoming opportunities to shape policy decisions, some ways for you to communicate effectively about your experience with MECFS, whether you're a patient, a caregiver, or 
another stakeholder, a physician, a scientist, or um, somebody who, who has other skills and experience to uh, may be valuable in these policy settings. And then finally, what steps you can take next to help shape policy decisions. So that's just sort of a little roadmap for today's discussion. Um, I'm going to take just a, a couple of minutes here to share with you this new um, initiative that the Food and Drug Administration uh, introduced last summer. And um, these letters and terms, there's a lot of mumbo jumbo, there's a lot of jargon, there's uh, a lot of, of complexity wrapped up in this little two-piece infographic uh, that the FDA has um, uh, created and posted on its website. And I don't want folks to get too hung up in any of these um, very layered processes or long terms. But what I do want you to know is that we have an unbelievably unique and important opportunity um, right ahead of us in the next three weeks. Um, with a piece of legislation that was passed last summer called PDUFA. Yeah, very weird name. Sounds like something you'd use to layer on uh, your bath product in the shower or something. PDUFA stands for the Pre Prescription Drug User Fee Act, and it's referenced here at the bottom of this um, FDA graphic. It is the law that dictates how drug companies uh, interface with the FDA when they want to get a product approved for uh, marketing in the United States to the public. So part of the, the most recent version of this PDUPA law included something brand new called the Patient Focused Drug Development Initiative. And it is a requirement that the FDA hold over the next five years 20 disease specific meetings to gather patient input about their condition that will help the FDA make decisions about drug, uh, the study of drugs and the approval of drugs and the marketing of drugs um, at each of these steps that are outlined in this infographic. So this is uh, ironically a 12-step process that the FDA goes through from the time that a drug is first conceived of in the laboratory as compound all the way to once it's on the marketing shelves and available to consumers and they have to um, do what's called post-marketing surveillance to make sure that that product is being used safely and effectively once it's in the marketplace. And this patient-focused drug development initiative is really designed to help FDA make better decisions about the products it reviews at every step along the way for specific conditions. And you, if you think of this in terms of if the FDA had the same set of rules and policies for drugs that treat um, something like the, the common cough that you might get either as a result of allergies or a cold or an upper respiratory infection, as they did for a terminal life-threatening disease that has a, a life expectancy of six months, it would be nearly impossible to get um, products approved using the same set of rules and policies. So this whole patient-focused drug development initiative is really designed to understand 20 conditions, and they've started out with the figure of 20, um, in really fine-grained manner so that they can make very specific decisions about that condition and the treatments and the patients who will be served by it at every step along this way. So again, this is, um, these 20 meetings are an effort to solicit and assess how patient experience should impact decisions. Um, and what they're going to do, I have um, been privileged to uh, be part of what's called the process uh, consultation for how they're going to set up all of these meetings across 20 different diseases um, so that there are, is a standard format with some elements that will vary depending on the type of disease, whether it's chronic uh, or acute, whether it is a rare disease or a very common one, whether it affects people um, lifelong from birth or whether it's something you might acquire later in life or at a different stage of life. So there does have to be some flexibility, but they want to conduct these 
meetings in a consistent way so that they can then have a, a comparable set of data across 20 different diseases. And the really important thing is that CFS and ME will be the subject of the very first of these 20 meetings. So uh, again, this is a unique and historic opportunity. Um, there is a, hey Lee, could you um, silence your mic until you're ready mm -hmm. to jump in there? Here's background noise. Distracting. Thanks. So there is a, um, a daily publication that is circulated widely throughout anybody who works in the pharmaceutical or biotech industry called the Daily Pink Sheet. And this is just a quote from the Daily Pink Sheet on the day that it was announced that CFSME, ME-CFS, CFS enemy would be the focus of the very first one of these um, 20 meetings that will occur over the next five years. And so again, the Daily Pink Sheet kind of being this outside third party that hasn't paid much attention to ME-CFS in the past, um, recognizing that this designation by the FDA to pick ME-CFS as the first one really makes us the test case and the example. And it is one of the reasons that the association has um, made this investment in the webinar series and the patient focus survey, so that we have the best um, possibility of making a very visible and uh, important and positive impact on the way that disease discovery um, moves forward for MCFS. So the FDA workshop that is occurring on April 25th and 26th um, is really the, where this patient-focused drug development initiative will start. Um, the meeting, uh, the workshop on the 25th and 26th, in just three weeks, is open to the public. It will also be webcast and live, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, and it has a two-day format. The first day is focused on this uh, being the, the sort of uh, premier case of the patient-focused drug development initiative. And again, that means gathering patients' perspectives on their symptoms, on the daily impacts that um, affect their lives most, and, on, and their perspectives on the current approaches um, to treating MECFS. And um, these, are, these are the type of questions that are going to be asked at every one of these 20 meetings. So there may be, you know, Again, some variation on the theme, but the core of the information that FDA is looking for is going to be re repeated across 20 different disease states. On the second day, the workshop will take on more of a usual type of conference um, format. There will be a scientific discussion that involves patients, clinicians, researchers, and government experts, and that agenda and list of speakers is available on our site and on the FDA site. Again, include a link to that information if you haven't seen it already. And um, those conversations are going to focus on a number of different topics. For instance, our scientific director, Suzanne Vernon, will be giving a talk about drug repurposing, which is finding new uses for old drugs, um, and a project that we've been doing with a company called BioVista to try to find some um, non-obvious uh, drug therapies that might have utility in MECFS. They'll also be looking at um, identifying what are called outcome measures to determine if disease symptoms improve with specific drug interventions. So uh, if we think back to drugs that have had sort of high visibility uh, in treating MECFS, the most obvious of those is Amplogen, which is the only drug to have gotten all the way through phase three trials and gone before FDA um, to seek approval for it to be marketed and made available on a much wider basis than it has been to date. Um, the, the outcome measure that the um, Amplogen trials were based on was the amount of time that patients could spend on a treadmill test. So that was the outcome measure chosen for those clinical trials. Um, other drug trials depending on, on what symptoms that drug, particular drug tries to treat, might use very different outcome measures. So that becomes an important barometer of whether a drug is successful, um, effective, and useful or not in a particular condition. So knowing ahead of time what symptoms need to be influenced and how to measure those symptoms is a really key element of um, getting a drug approved 
by the FDA. And that will be, I think, a, a big um, emphasis of the workshop uh, on the second day. And again, this first day is the um, first session of these 20 that the FDA will conduct uh, on the patient-focused drug development initiative. And it's a major opportunity, so that's why we've got today's topic. Now, there are several opportunities for advocates to participate in the FDA workshop. The first that is available right now is what's called the FDA document. This is an online mechanism that patients uh, and really anybody can use to answer a series of open-ended questions about symptoms and treatment. And when you submit to the FDA docket, um, you are submitting your information directly to the FDA. And um, that has uh, obvious benefits because it's unfiltered. What you say will be transmitted directly to the FDA and they'll have the benefit of that higher um, answer that you provide. Um, some people have been concerned about whether there is um, the privacy rules and, and all of those things, um, the federal agencies being connected one to the other. I believe, you know, that, that HIPAA requirements and you know, privacy rules all are um, part of this docket process. They use it you know, day in, day out for a, a large number of topics across the federal government and within the FDA specifically, but those concerns have been raised um, and, um, you know, are important for people to think about when they decide how to participate. Um, a second way to participate is uh, a CFIS association, our organization, has set up a survey and we have posed the same questions that FDA has in the very same language that they've used. And we've added some additional questions that we thought were important, um, additional context setting for this particular um, opportunity. And we will be analyzing all the responses. And as I said earlier, we have nearly a thousand uh, responses so far um, using something called nat natural language processing and parts of speech tools um, that will take the text that comes in from the individuals and help parse that so that we can um, start to make sense of it and start to also take the nuances of what people's answers might be and not just look for key words because you might find the word aspirin in three different responses and one person saying aspirin really helps me, another person saying I can't tolerate aspirin or aspirin makes me worse. And the fact that aspirin pops up wouldn't be um, helpful if we only looked at aspirin and said aspirin pops up, but we don't really know why. So we're going to, uh, we've made an investment in um, some um, very expert help to help us make sense of the um, text answers that are coming in, and we will have um, at least a, you know, an initial analysis ready in time to present to the FDA at the meeting in April, and we will also make that uh, very valuable information available and other policy settings like the upcoming um, federal CFS advisory committee meeting that will take place next month in May. A third opportunity for advocates to participate is the CHU JSON survey. Uh, Dr. Lily Chu, who's a very visible patient advocate and a former physician uh, who had to retire due to her illness, and Dr. Leonard Jason at DePaul University have set up a survey um, with some questions that are very similar to the ones that the FDA has asked, although they um, have used answers in a multiple choice format, um, both to make it easier for people completing the survey and also to um, just help them remember some of the, the potential answers that might be out there. It's, it's awfully uh, burdensome to expect people to have sort of a comprehensive ability to recall and and type in answers in an open format. So we see this as a very complementary set of survey tools that will hopefully elicit some really important information using two very different formats. There is also an opportunity to submit written testimony um, to the FDA. There is uh, an opportunity to participate during the meeting for those who are able to attend in person. And um, 
that's really important and it's a difference from the federal CFS advisory committee meetings where there are opportunities um, to submit testimony either by phone or um, by video. The FDA didn't have that capacity to do that this time. So if you want to participate in the first day session, this patient-focused drug development initiative, you do have to be there in person. Um, in order to participate in the meeting in either format, in person or by webcast, you have to register to attend by April 8th. And we'll go through this in the action steps at the end. Um, and if you want to participate in the meeting and you'll be there in person, you need to indicate that preference during the registration process. And it's pretty straightforward uh, how to do that. There's a couple of just quick check, uh, check boxes as you're moving through the registration tool online. Um, the next way, if, if you're not able to get to Bethesda on April 25th and 26th, it will be webcast live, uh, although that does require uh, pre-registration in advance, and again, that information will be in your follow-up email, or you can choose to watch the webcast archive at a later date. So, nice, um, pretty wide array of technology-enhanced opportunities aside from having to get on a plane, a train, or a car, or a cab to get to Bethesda on those dates. I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to turn this over to Lee. You're probably tired of hearing my voice. And she's got some things to add, and I'd love to hear, we need to hear from her about some right. of the ways that FDA can measure success for this set of programs. Right. Thanks, Kim. It's a perfect, you queued it up perfectly, and I think that all the information that's come before is critical because it informs everything that we are going to talk about next. Um, it's important to know how the FDA will measure success, and that's a lot of what Kim has already been laying out for us. They are gathering the input that they will believe will be most helpful to this process. So we need to understand their goal. Uh, their goal is to explore and develop the process for collecting patient input. And as Kim mentioned earlier, it's a tremendous opportunity for the NECFS community. They've sort of opened the communication venues wide, and this is the first of uh, many, you know, 20 meetings that are going to be happening, and our, our patient community gets to set the tone and be the first to deliver. And that's a really exciting position that we're in. So we want to ensure that um, you all are as prepared as possible, that we can speak with a loud and clear voice um, and meet their goals because they're, this is their test. They're going to be measuring the success of this particular initiative. And so we need to be um, ready to speak to what they're looking for most. The patient input has to be collected in a way that it will be useful to the reviewers in the future. It's not just about the standalone workshop and the following meeting, it's, it's about uh, how this information informs things uh, for the path forward. So specifically what they're looking for here are what are the most significant symptoms uh, that affect your life and how has the condition impacted your quality of life? What treatments have you tried and what impact have those treatments had on you? Um, those are some core questions, some core answers that they're looking for. So we want to make sure that all the information we present speaks to this. Uh, this kind of, of input is what the FDA believes it really needs to create a, a rich contextual uh, understanding of the severity of the condition um, and available treatments and, and available treatments in the future. So it's important that as you fill out a survey, as you prepare to submit written testimony, if you're able to attend the meeting in, per, in person and you are able to speak, that you keep these questions in front of you and that this is what you seek to answer uh, for them in a focused way. Kim, can you, I am not able to move the slide forward. I'll try now, I'll just switch the uh, keyboard and mouse to you. It is not uh, working, so if you don't mind just forwarding the slide for me, that would be great. Yep. It's important uh, that we 
we paint the right picture. Uh, and that words, you know, it's all, uh, a picture paints a thousand words. And so you, you want to make sure that the words you're using match the picture you're trying to portray. Can go ahead and, and forward that for me. These are just uh, some silly examples of how if you're painting the wrong picture. Uh, this was pulled out of a newspaper a while back. Remember the supersonic skydiver that reached Mach 1.25 on his record jump? Uh, now the picture above it isn't directly related to that article, but because of poor placement, because it wasn't related to what came after it, it actually, visually, you're going to look at that and it's going to present um, a very different picture than I think what they, they intended it to be. Go ahead and uh, click the next one. Okay, I think I have controls now. Uh, this, of course, is just a little ad for some flea and, and tick killer. They probably intended for uh, it to look like a cute little puppy sleeping in the grass, but um, actually it looks like the dog is deceased. So, uh, again, you want to choose the words carefully, put them with the right visual representation to make sure you're getting the right point across. I'm stuck again, Kim. Again, on choosing your words carefully, continue. Uh, this is a little ad for the Lakeview Memorial Estates. It says, Lakeview Memorial Estates is a private cemetery. If you'd like information on people buried there, please contact them directly. Uh, obviously, you can't talk to the dead, so that isn't really what they intended to say. But some misplaced modifiers in the sentence, they phrased it the wrong way, and they got around the very uh, wrong point. Next one, Kim. Porta potties reduced to steaming piles. Again, we use a very different intention than what uh, they, they probably, I don't need to get much more on that. Uh, next. And you also want to make sure you're checking for mistakes, particularly in the wit written word. This is, is two-sided. Um, obviously, I don't think they intend to blow up Syrians. They probably mean sirens. Um, but it completely changed the context of, of that sentence. When we're, we're speaking in the written word, there's two different kinds of mistakes. One is um, just a typo, like we have in this silly example here. But the other is phrasing something in a way that um, when someone reads it, uh, their reaction is what they intuned your sentence to say is very different than what you meant. So whenever the opportunity is there, let somebody else read what you've said and say, does this get the point across the way that I it, it intended it to come across, or does it mean something different? I, and I've been a writer for 20 years, but I always have someone else check my work. And I am always amazed at the times that I go, oh, that is not at all what I intended to say there, because someone else hears it uh, in a different manner. So that's that check, check for mistakes. You also want to place the emphasis on the right thing. And you can go through these pretty quickly, Kim. These are just some silly examples. Um, she saw a puppy and a kitten on the way to the store. I wish that my puppy would go to the store for me, but that um, obviously that is not what they intended. Next. Eagerly awaiting her birthday, Mary's presents were all picked up and admired by Mary many times throughout the course of the day. Now, were the presents uh, awaiting her birthday um, or was Mary? Uh, next. Three offices were reported robbed by the Atlanta police last week. Um, Hopefully, the Atlanta police don't go around robbing offices uh, more often, and that was just a typo. Next. And she served sandwiches to the children on paper plates. Um, obviously, my inflection there changes something, but technically, the sentence implies that the children are on paper plates. Now, these are just some silly examples. You can go on to the next one. Uh, these are just some silly examples, obviously, but I use them to illustrate a point. Uh, the words we choose matter. The language we choose matters. And uh, this is such a critical, important opportunity. It's critical to this entire process with FDA. It's critical to the MECFS community. And so uh, I know we're harkening back a little bit to maybe your grade school English class with those misplaced modifiers in the sentences. But I do, I, I choose those funny examples to illustrate a point how the, the words you choose, the order in which you put them, they do matter and they do um, affect how the person on the receiving end hears what you're, what you're putting across. You want to be sure that we're speaking their language. You want to set the right tone. Um, as we mentioned earlier, as Kim covered, as I reviewed at the start, start of my section, they have some very specific objectives that they are looking to meet. We want to speak in such a way, you want to speak in such a way that they will hear you. 
you want to ensure that you are specific, that you are concise, and that um, you are speaking in a compelling way about your symptoms. Um, and offer clear and tangible examples of, of life impact. Here's an example. Um, it's one thing to say, uh, I have a hard time with en enough energy. Fatigue is an issue. I have trouble having enough energy to get through the day. Then to say, these are specific things through the day that zap my energy, and I know it's a good day if I can just make a salad for dinner. You've explained uh, the symptom, but you've given it a direct life impact. It matters to you, to the family, that you're able to put, to put dinner on the table and have enough energy to see it through. That's just one example someone has, has shared with me you know, recently. Um, so you want to be very specific about things that um, positively and negatively impact your life, and then give it that life impact moment. But it's also important that you self-edit. When I'm writing, I put it all out there and then go back and hack out. and. Um, Consolidate your words. Uh, it, it, here's a, a, a life example is I used to do some theater and a friend who was hilarious. But when he wrote a show, it ended up being four hours long. Individually, each joke was funny. But when the show was too long, people tuned out and didn't hear you. On a very serious topic, the same thing holds true. We've got a very important story to tell about what life truly is like with ME and CFS, how it truly impacts you. But if your responses are too long, um, human nature is they, they stop hearing what you have to say. They, they stop reading the important words that you put forth on the paper. So that self-editing and concise, powerfully chosen words are really important. Um, next, please. You know, they must be able to tie any future approved therapies to very Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy or speak about a lot. They go hand in hand, particularly with the FDA. Um, it not only has to be effective, but it has to be safe. It can be safe as possible, but if they can't directly tie it to a very specific symptom, negative impact that this particular therapy helps you overcome, they can't approve it. So we have to get both. Um, so we're helping them fill in the blanks that he, prior to this they didn't, they didn't have. Um, next. So just keep that in context as you're formulating any, any of your answers. Thanks. Um, when you're communicating in written or spoken word, again, there are some key things you want to avoid and some things that you uh, want to focus on. It's all called, I, I can start setting, setting the right tune and communicating effectively. There's what you say which sometimes can be very different from what people hear. All of these tips and tactics we're giving you now are to help someone hear what you intend to say. Um, and so you want to avoid certain things. You want to avoid jumping to conclusions. That's uh, in infusing any of your responses or information with broad personal interpretations that are not based on fact. Um, abstract, uh, broad, sweeping statements. If you lump the entire community together, if you say everyone is this way, uh, it's always that. Um, because of X, we get Y. Uh, I'm sure in your mind you can think of some different examples of, of things that are directly related in your life. But if, if you speak too much to an extreme and you get into conclusion, uh, jumping to conclusion based on a personal interpretation, then people tend to not hear what comes next. Um, it's just like when you get into somebody that, that was in debate class in high school and they argue their point to such an extreme that it tends to lose some of the validity of the point they're trying to make. So keeping it balanced and keeping it to facts that you know of firsthand in your life will be the most effective way to be heard. If you have language that's way too abstract, that's incredibly formal, um, or you start using a lot of jargon, not everyone's going to know the jargon or understand what your $5 thesaurus word means. Um, and so you want to keep it, use clean and concise words. And again, um, don't be too abstract. Get back to the specificity that we spoke about earlier and self-edit so you can have a tight answer. It's harder to speak in fewer words, but that's critically important. Um, it also, uh, I know that um, uh, your time, your energy, your words is a, is, a, is a priceless commodity in your life. 
So conserve that energy by choosing very, very wisely the, use, the words that you use that are as strongly effective as possible. You also want to avoid stereotypes and generalizations. You don't want to say, ev um, you never know who you might offend in the room. You never know who is the, there's always an exception to every rule. Um, there are, if you have too broad of a generalization and you speak to it too vehemently, then you've just um, excluded some people in the room. And if in the mind of the, the gentleman or lady from the FDA that is processing all of this information, if you've swept to a stereotype or a broad generalization or brought some of these things we're talking about into the conversation, again, it minimizes, you've minimized the incredibly valid points that you have that are coming next. Uh, next slide, or hit next, please. I just, that, that little graphic is to say, you know, it's not always the person that screams the loudest or uses the most words or has the greatest greatest volume, so to speak, um, that is, is listened to. That you might uh, just become that noise in the ear and they tune out and don't hear the rest of, of what you have to say. What we want to do is ensure that the incredibly valid points that you have to make, the input that only a patient can give, is heard. Uh, next. Lee, and I'll just add that one of the things that's been really interesting um, through the, the survey that we've um, been so grateful to have received so many responses to is the diversity of experience. There is, of course, some very common elements throughout all of the responses, but there are also some very um, individualized and unique expressions being conveyed. And as Lee has said, you know, jumping to stereotypes and generalizations and all and always and never and um, can really dilute the powerful impact of everyone being able to share their own experience. So I'll Absolutely. just echo what Lee has said. Absolutely. There are some, those are some not to do's, some things to avoid. I want to also give you some strategies, uh, things you can do to increase uh, your effectiveness. You know, you want to make sure that you focus on the issue at hand and you leave any personal misgivings about the government, the FDA, HHS, CDC, all of those groups out of the discussion. They have invited us to their house. They have invited us to their table. And they're trying to set a new tone with the patient community. The better we embrace this opportunity and see it as the dawn of the new day, uh, the more positively we come to the table, the more ready they will be to, to listen and to really hear. Um, and then we can make a really positive impact. This isn't the place for any of those um, negative feelings towards the past. We have to embrace the opportunity moving forward. That's not to minimize them or say that some of those issues might not be completely valid, uh, but this isn't the right forum to bring that into play. It's, it's the old thing of um, if you ever watch the Oscars and they're broadcast live and whenever you get a star that has a particular um, bent something they're rather passionate about, and instead of giving their acceptance speech, they 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 go on a completely different tangent to talk about their cause. Uh, while initially that could be a big boost for their cause, it, it really they get tuned out. The, the orchestra starts to play. They cut to commercial, but uh, the people they most want to reach aren't going to hear that. And um, we want most want to reach the FDA and the the folks that are in the room that are driving this process. And so um, we have to extend the hand of friendship and, and partnership. And so that's a part of expressing some genuine desire to be a part of the joint solution. The reality is we can't move safe and effective treatments forward without the FDA. But what the FDA is finally figuring out is they can't do it without us. And so this truly is, is a partnership. And um, the more we embrace that, uh, and let them know that we have embraced that individually and collectively, the more they are, will be open to hearing so much of the valid points each individual has to make about their own life journey with ME and CFS, which will positively impact the process going forward. To that end, you want to be authentic. Uh, don't be manipulative. It's, um, it's, it's one thing to make your point. As, in, as clearly, effectively, and authentically as you can, speaking from your heart. It's another to choose incredibly um, overly manipulative terms or uh, uh, 
uh, go on a particular bent that just becomes um, something they'll tune out. And so striking that balance is tricky. That's where the old coming in of having someone else uh, either talk through it with them, what you want to say, or have them maybe review something that you're submitting to make sure we haven't crossed that line so that the core point you're trying to make is really heard. And the last point I want to make is to truly value yourself and your own experiences. They, the FDA is realizing how important the patient voice is. Um, it is a critical step in, in the process. I think the more we, each individual can come to the table or come to their computer uh, to type in their responses and understand that their voice has value, their experience matters. Um, they are not, the FDA isn't doing us a favor. Uh, we're on equal footing here. And, uh, and ultimately, they all work for us. You know, the government is, is in place because of, of the way, because we put them there. And so um, recognize that uh, while this is definitely a partnership, we don't ever want to, to stomp all over them or make them or berate them in any way. Uh, we just want to embrace the fact that, that the story you have to tell has incredible value. Your experience is um, important to framing the process and where we go from here, and use that as a guide point to, to move you through your responses and your and your testimony. Next, please. Uh, so then we want to talk a little bit, and Kim, feel free to jump in uh, on this as well, because I think you know this landscape even better than me. Um, but we want to talk about it, it's important to remember how the information is going to be used, what happens with it beyond. Uh, the meeting. If you understand what's down the road and around the corner and, and the journey we're on, what's the destination, where are we headed, that'll help you set out the roadmap now. And that's really what all of these responses and input from patients are doing is helping to set that, that roadmap. But you have to know and keep in mind at all times where's the FDA headed. So um, the information will be used to provide better context for assessing drug applications for MECFS. That's that whole um, safe and effective. What uh, symptom is it affecting? And is it having enough of an effect? Is the application um, strong enough to outweigh uh, the risks that are there with any drug? There's always some, um, some risk involved. So they have to be able to make those direct correlations. That's why the clarity you all are bringing uh, to the symptoms and the, the effects that you live with every day matter. Um, think about it in terms of uh, if I, uh, when they wanted to repurpose aspirin from just being uh, a headache medication to actually having effectiveness in stopping the damage of a heart attack, it was important that they drew those direct correlations. This is what it does in the body and how it directly affects this. When they were able to make those strong lines, they were able to repurpose and say, this drug has efficacy in this, in this way. Um, it's important that they can make those direct direct connections and how the drug applications work. Um, it's, again, that better understanding of the risk and benefit uh, that we've been speaking about throughout. What they, they do a lot to identify what the risks are. Then they have to tie that to a direct benefit. Is there increased, is energy um, fatigue a critical issue? Um, or is something else a critical issue? And what does this drug specifically uh, tackle and does it increase someone's functionality to a great enough degree to outweigh any risk that's there. They also want to develop outcome measures to assess Im Im improvements. They have to be measurable and specific. This is where that specific language comes from. It's the I could spend five minutes on a treadmill and after the, the drug I could spend ten. What are the very specific and measurable, measurable improvements um, that are an outcome of the resultant of this therapy. They want to be able to, to create that roadmap for the industry. They want to give this, be able to give some information to the industry to develop for development and repurposing, repositioning potential therapies for testing in MECFS. So right now, um, there is a very large crowd, a big umbrella of here's the entire MECFS uh, and multiple other uh, subtypes that are kind of lumped together. What the process is doing is helping us differentiate, diversify, get more specific, and be able to see that under the sort of more global CFS umbrella, these are some very specific um, 
ways that the NECFS that they they it, that it impacts a person's life. Uh, one person may have a lot of cognitive issues. The other person may have a lot of pain. Someone else may have um, some some vision issues because their eyes get so tired they can't read the page very well. Um, what are those specific things, and where will they target? And how do we get therapies that that we're not putting a square peg into a round hole? How do we make all those puzzle pieces fit together? Um, is there anything you wanted to specifically add to this bit of information, Kim? Yeah, thanks, Lee. So, um, you know, thinking about uh, how this information translates for the FDA, um, that infographic that I showed at the beginning, FDA has to make decisions about whether mm -hmm. to um, let a specific researcher or a company or a clinical trial um, move forward to the next step based on what they know about the condition that mm -hmm. is being uh, that is the subject of, of that study and also the treatment that is being used in those studies. So the more they understand about the severity and the impact of CFS, MECFS, the better they will be able to um, tolerate some of the risks that are inherent in letting clinical trials go forward. And um, so that's, that's why it's such a tremendous opportunity for MECFS to be the very first condition in this set of meetings. And the, the other thing is, if you think about um, the landscape right now for drug development in MECFS, there have been a few pioneers. So, uh, you know, the Christopher Columbus starting out in Spain and heading for the New World, there is a very you know, narrow group of people with the right personality characteristics and the financing to be able to pull that off and to actually you know, get the ships and the supplies and head off into uncharted territory about how you would get the first drug approved for MECFS. If the FDA helps set some guideposts, and says, these are the outcome measures that you might consider using. These are the symptoms that patients have indicated are the most um, problematic for them on a day-to-day -day basis that they would most like to have relieved or improved. Then it gives drug companies um, an idea of where to look in their arsenal of potential therapies um, for some possible uh, marketable opportunities. and. Um, if you pay any attention at all to the press about the pharmaceutical industry right now, um, companies large and small are facing what's called the patent cliff, where some of the biggest blockbuster drugs are um, getting to the end of their patent protection and will soon be available as generics. Um, and the companies don't have as much of a profit motive once the, once the particular drug um, can be sold in, in generic form, the brand name tends to drop off in popularity and insurance companies won't pay for it um, as much as they will the generic. So drug companies right now are looking for ways to make the products they've already made an investment in more valuable through repurposing or repositioning, finding a new way to use an old drug. And we believe that there's tremendous opportunity there. And if we can encourage the investment by pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies to um, help make that journey across the ocean, um, across the drug development pipeline for MECFS, that there is reward uh, at the end of that journey for the patient population or subtype, subpopulations within the larger patient population, as well as for um, the profit-oriented pharmaceutical companies. And make no mistake about it, they are in this for uh, the financial rewards in addition to the humanitarian uh, rewards. But they have to be able to um, report positive impact to their stockholders, and that's the thing that drives their investment. So anything that FDA does to help them know what the tests are going to be like along the journey and know when they're going to need supplies and how to, uh, you know, when to turn south and when to turn north uh, along that, um, that, that trip 
is going to make the investment a safer investment for the company to uh, set out on. And we'll be talking about some of these issues next week. Um, the topic for next week is what does the term safe and effective really mean? And it comes back to a lot of the issues right here. And it's really important. We had originally scheduled that session uh, before today's, but we wanted to get this information out to you before the deadlines that FDA set. So we, we made a little adjustment in the um, schedule to accommodate that. But the, the understanding of what safe and effective means is really important as we all think together as a community about how how to make that journey uh, as fast and as safely and as um, well for as many people as possible from where we are now with very few um, approved options available for only symptomatic relief to disease modifying and curative type therapies in the future. Okay, I think I grabbed back the uh, so let's um, think we're, we're close to, we're past the end of the hour that we had planned, and thanks for uh, hanging in there for just a couple more minutes. We wanted to give you some very concrete action steps. And some of you, uh, through the registration process, shared with us that you had already taken some of these actions. Um, but just to reiterate sort of what the, the timelines look like as we move toward the April 25th, 26th workshop, and then into May for the Federal Advisory Committee meeting. Um, Monday is sort of the deadline that FDA has set for the registration process. And just another reminder, we've said this many times today in many ways through our other communications vehicles, um, you have to register to attend either in person or by webcast. And that's um, very different. The, Federal Advisory Committee meetings, you don't have to register to participate in the webcast. And for the December 20th uh, Amplogen FDA meeting, you didn't have to register for the webcast. But they uh, are, are requiring that. And everybody who wants to participate in person or online in that meeting must register. And again, you'll get an email from us within the next day or two. And we will repeat that link to um, the Eventbrite site where FDA has set up its registration process. If you are going to be in Bethesda on April 25th and 26th and would like to participate in one of the panels or give testimony, um, you can indicate that interest as you do the same registration. And if you want to make any kind of comments during the meeting, you need to give FDA a brief statement about the nature of the comments by Monday, although they are not requiring the full script of what you're going to say um, this time. That's a difference, again, from the Federal Advisory Committee meetings where you have to submit your full testimony sometimes in advance of when the agenda is published um, before they select who the speakers are. Um, so just keep in mind that April 8th date is, is coming up even sooner than tax day. Uh, so we've, we've all got a task ahead of us to, to make sure that we're registered and that our preferences for um, participating are stated through that process. Our survey, uh, the patient focus survey that, that we have launched, will be open for uh, the foreseeable future. But we will take the last snapshot of all the data to crunch it down for the FDA meeting by about April 17th. Um, we've made it possible for you to enter that survey and do pieces and parts of it and go back to it later. So if you have started it or um, uh, haven't yet gotten to it, please uh, make every effort to do that by April 17th so that we can make sure and include your uh, responses in our uh, natural language processing analysis of the text answers we receive. Um, we'll be able to do. Uh, an analysis of, of the um, other types of questions closer to the date. But we really want to do uh, as thorough a job as we can with as many responses as possible in time for the FDA meeting. And then, of course, the um, dates of the meeting, 25th and 26th of April, um, when the actual workshop is taking place, you can be there in person or by webcast, provided you have registered to attend in advance. 
The next um, opportunity coming up after the FDA workshop is the Federal CFS Advisory Committee meeting. This is uh, one of the very few disease-specific advisory, committee, advisory committees to the Secretary for Health and Human Services um, that exists throughout the entire government. So this is a venue that the CFIDS Association helped to create back in the 90s and that we have protected through three different uh, presidential administrations and remains uh, active to this date. Um, the next meeting of that committee will be May 22nd and 23rd, and it, um, the details for that meeting have not yet been released, but they generally take place in Washington, D.C. I can think of only one time in the last 20 years when it was somewhere else other than Washington, D.C. Um, they are usually webcast live, um, but that detail uh, does change sometimes, and, and sometimes they only audio cast live, but the webcast is available later. So um, let's stay tuned for that specific detail. And they usually allocate two to three hours of the two-day meeting time for advocate testimony. And again, they usually accept it by phone, by video. Um, somebody else can read the testimony who's attending the meeting, or you can do it uh, yourself. And please watch for updates on our, in our Research First News e-newsletter and on Facebook and Twitter. We'll keep everybody updated as soon as those details are made available by the Department of Health and Human Services. And I'm delighted to announce um, that the CFS Advisory Committee has recently, through its most recent charter, added three new liaison organizations to the group that sits around the table at those meetings. And if you've ever been to one, um, there is a, uh, a very static format that they use where all the members of the committee are seated around an open uh, an open circle um, conference table and anybody attending as a participant is seated in chairs uh, in theater style on the other end of the room and there's little interaction um, little opportunity for interaction between the committee member dialogue and the the participants that are really just viewers so the addition of three liaison organizations who will be seated at that table is, is a good sign. And the CFIDS Association of America was uh, invited um, as a result of our application for one of those positions to participate in that way. And uh, we enthusiastically uh, accepted that invitation. And um, Lee and I will be attending the meeting uh, on May 22nd, 23rd. Um, and as we said, more details are forthcoming. The agenda is generally published just uh, a week or two before the meeting, but we'll, we'll share as many details as we have as we receive them uh, with subscribers to our Research First News and also through Facebook and Twitter. And then just a reminder about the other four programs in our series, uh, the next one coming up is uh, what does the phrase safe and effective treatment really mean? And again, back to just a couple of slides ago to emphasize how important every single one of those four words is in understanding what it is the FDA will be looking for and what drug companies and biotech companies are trying to accomplish when they um, set out on uh, treatment-related research. We covered a bit of that last week with Kristen Shaman from Faster Cures, and we'll actually go into a little bit more detail um, next week as to how each of those terms um, is represented by the comments that you're being asked to provide the FDA. And that will be uh, Dr. Suzanne Vernon, our scientific director, and I will uh, lead that webinar program next week. Just um, for your future reference, some, some other ways to get information um, are researchfirst.com. That could be .org. You can get to it either way. Um, that website has a lot of information about the spring series. We'll post a link to the recording from today's webinar and additional resources that we've mentioned. And you can sign up for email updates on new blog posts so you're the first to uh, learn about uh, new content added to the Research First site. We have a Research First News uh, free monthly e-newsletter that looks like this over here, and you can sign up for that um, very easily and quickly so that you don't miss anything and get a nice week, uh, monthly digest of everything happening uh, in research policy and uh, media. 
and then we also use our social media tools, Facebook, Twitter, and our recordings for the uh, webinar series will be posted on our YouTube channel at Solve CFS. Did I miss anything there, Lee? Sorry, I was muted. I was trying to get to my button. No, I think it was good. I, I would just really encourage everyone, um, if you're not plugged into all those ways that, that Kim noted, you could be plugged in. Um, please do. Uh, it, we're, it's important that we have, uh, that we build community. And these are some ways that you can feel connected uh, to that MECFS community and, and something we definitely want to want to bring bring to bear. So get connected and get plugged in. Um, we introduced this last week, but uh, the association's uh, staff and board of directors has recently um, just come to the next step in uh, a longer strategic planning process. And you'll recognize a new visual identity, a new logo that we um, have adopted from our uh, Research Institute Without Walls logo and brought it over to give the association's visual identity a new look and also a new tagline, leveraging patient-centered research to cure MECFS. And uh, I've been asked about the term patient-centered, and we've talked about patient-focused um, in this webinar already, but there is a, a whole new awareness about the value of the patient um, in the research landscape. And we are uh, have always been committed to that. It's been our legacy and our history for uh, 26 years now, and we're you know, making that very explicit in our organizational identity now because we do feel that um, this organization and the patients who support it and their loved ones really are driven by the idea that we all want for this condition, this disease, to no longer exist and take a toll on humanity the way that it has. And we're putting the patients at the center, and really we're putting you at the center of everything that we do. And want you to know that um, quite emphatically, that all of us feel that very strongly. And we keep it first and foremost in our minds every day as we think about the work that we do and the people um, who are the recipients of uh, the services that we provide. <coughs> Lee, I'm going to let you speak a few minute a minute there and I'm going to just check and make sure that um, the recording is going smoothly before sure. we wrap up. Anything else to add? No, I just think that um, I, again I know that uh, investing an hour and 13 minutes of your valuable energy uh, is a big investment for you. Um, we understand that uh, what a toll that that can take uh, and, and what it means to your life. And so um, if we have, um, there's something we didn't cover that you wish that we had brought up today, be sure and let us know that. This is a, uh, even though we can't open the lines for um, a lot of Q&A vocally on a webinar with this many people on it, um, those lines of communication are always open. Um, as Kim said, you are at the center of everything we do and so that, just like we've been talking about that effective communication with the FDA, that goes for us as well. Um, uh, our goal is to, to get to know you better all the time and to keep you at the center of, of what we do. And so um, that's why being plugged in to things like Facebook and, and Twitter and, and participating in venues like this, emailing us, calling us, um, that, all, that all matters to us and we, we are listening. So again, we thank you for your investment of time. We hope it's been valuable, and we look very forward to continuing to engage with you on, uh, on not just these webinars as we uh, charge forward on this important uh, FDA process, but um, engaging with you throughout the year uh, and, and in the future. Great. Thanks, Lee, and uh, I'll just wrap it up now. There are a couple of questions that came in um, about how exactly to submit comments directly to the FDA. Again, we'll send out an email, or GoToMeeting will actually send out an email that will include a lot of uh, links to things that we have 
specifically mentioned. It's a little hard to convey URLs over audio, so um, we didn't take the time to include all those in our slides, but you will get links to the FDA docket, the agenda for the FDA meeting, um, a link to our patient-focused uh, survey tool, and some of the other things that we talked about today. And there were questions about specific treatments. That wasn't really uh, the topic that we uh, had focused on for today, but um, you know, we know that there is a big interest in that, and we'll keep that in mind, uh, as well as the opportunity for exploration of non-drug therapies, things like physical therapy, devices, um, those are all important in the landscape, and we'll talk a bit about that uh, topic next week on the Safe and Effective Treatments uh, webinar. So we hope you'll join us, and we thank you for your time and energy and attention this afternoon. Uh, apologize for the audio issues at the beginning, and hope that the recording uh, will be posted later today or uh, tomorrow early in the day so that if you've uh, got other people you know that would like to have benefit of this information, you can share it with them as well. Uh, thanks so much, Lee, for helping uh, everybody understand the importance of effective communication. And we look forward to um, the program next week and your comments in between. So again, everyone have a, a pleasant rest of the day. Rest well after the expenditure of time and energy this afternoon. And uh, have a good weekend. Take care. Take care.